<laughs> so today I'm going to be talking about uh, data science, uh, particularly with a focus on the um, interdisciplinary uh, aspects of data science and how it fits into uh, an institution like UNM. Um, starting first with a, uh, a little story about sort of how I stumbled into this thing that now is called data science, but when I, was, when I started doing it, I really didn't think of it as such. And this is as I was doing hand-to-hand -hand combat with all of the various uh, data products and processes that I was working on in my dissertation, um, as I had this pile of stuff that I'd accumulated. And uh, 10 years ago, I was in the process of making sense of it and, and taking tabular data, Mylar maps from the archive in, in Illinois, um, other, other uh, uh, published data products and trying to assimilate them into a system where I could actually make uh, some sort of analysis product in looking at, in, in this case, the spatial patterning of prehistoric peoples in northeastern Arizona um, and how they respond to climate and potential productivity of the landscape. So there are a whole bunch of steps in this process, bringing all of these different data products into a system, um, generating new products as a result of those, those data, ultimately doing an analysis, integrating those, system, those into a system where I can do the analysis, and finally producing something like this, which is sort of a synthetic view of all of those data having come together where we can see the distribution of over 2,000 archaeological sites over a 1,000 year period showing up here. We can see some of the uh, precipitation uh, characteristics here over the study area and we can see the change through time over here. This is just an illustration of an outcome of what now you might think of as data science where I was the beneficiary of all of the work that was done by the preceding generation of researchers bringing together and curating the data from multiple research projects and making them available to me um, and also the ability to combine all of those data using a variety of tools and technologies to make sense of that. And it turns out that that is actually a common set of characteristics in this um, concept that we think of in terms of data science. Um, data science as a term, as, as an area of focus, um, goes back some distance. The Journal of, of Data Science actually goes back to 2002 when it, was start, when it started to be published. But it has really taken off much more recently as we see publications like The Fourth Paradigm talking about um, data intensive science, we have special issues of science, uh, science actually talking about the, the role of large data collections and, and uh, managing those data in the scientific enterprise. We have, of course, the popular view of, of data in terms of the personal data that we're all uh, potentially contributing to the social networks and other systems like Google and Facebook. Um, consideration in academia about how the, uh, the, the academic enterprise can produce that next generation of researchers and participants in these disciplines. Um, and then a whole slew of specialty publications that are really addressing the nuts and bolts of data science or analyzing the community of data scientists. Um, and you can see that you know, the, the trend of interest in data science is certainly on, you know, on the upslope. As we look here from August of 2008 to essentially present, you can see this steep increase in just the number of searches for the term data scientist or di data science as an indication, probably more than anything, of the popularity and popular interest in this idea of data science. Whether it's a matter of um, curiosity about how data science may be drilling through the data that are being accumulated about us, um, that's probably more so when we're looking at Google Trends than you know, folks that are looking to get jobs in data science or do better data science, but it's certainly on the uptick. And one char key characteristic that you often find associated with data science is this idea of big data. As poorly defined as that is, um, I, just, I found one online resource that had attempted to ac accumulate 
a variety of definitions, and just that one resource had 27 different definitions of big data that were sufficiently different to be called out uh, separately within their list. And of course, that is not a complete list either. Um, but you know, there are some common characteristics, you know, whether we call it big data or how we define big data, in terms of the velocity of data coming into the systems, the, in terms of the rapid increase of data, the uh, variety of data that are, um, that are being generated, uh, and in many cases, the, the uh, heterogeneity or the, the messiness of some of those data. And these are all challenges that data science needs to address. Um, this is a particular perspective on data science that was uh, published in uh, Foreign Affairs just last summer. Um, and I highlight it as a particular perspective because while there's some disagreement about you know, the importance of these particular aspects of the role of data science and big data, it is, um, it is representative of what you see in especially the business applications of data science where you know, there's sort of this magic bullet of a lot of data where you can essentially treat your analysis as being based on a population as opposed to a sample, uh, theoretically simplifying the, the conclusions you can reach about those data because those sampling methods versus population level description sort of it, it are not as critical. Um, there are issues with that. Uh, <laughs> um, this, uh, this second point about being able to work with messy data and uh, sort of reducing the need or necessity for curation and structuring of data. Again, that's not necessarily um, a, a, a topic for agreement uh, or a conclusion that everyone can agree on, but it certainly is a characteristic of a lot of these big data type problems where you're trying to bring multiple data sets, data streams into a system and figure out ways to um, knock, or knock off the rough edges of those data sets. Um, and this bottom question, I think, is actually much more appropriate sort of in the business applications of data science when it compared to the more academic or research oriented uh, data science work where there is this uh, sort of goal where the ends justify the means where if we can if we can identify correlations and those correlations are meaningful to us in a decision making context that's good enough um, often as we're working in the research enterprise we're actually trying to dig a little bit deeper into explanations for those correlations those correlations may be some early indicators of hypotheses that, that we want to subject to further testing. Um, but this is an area, another area where you get some distinctions between sort of the business applications of, of data science and academic applications. The reason this distinction between business and academic applications is important is because much of the literature about data science focuses on the business sort of uses and characteristics of data science as opposed to the academic use. As we're looking here at potential domain areas where data science can be used, whether it's in the humanities or in uh, uh, business and economics, the sciences or in engineering, all of these have potential um, application areas in domain science, but typically those are going to be exercised in conjunction with other disciplinary uh, areas, other special, specialization areas that, that bring in the data science as, a, as, a, as an augmentation of the disciplinary knowledge that is in these various domains. Starting with computer science. As we're dealing with larger and more complex data sets or working with analytic methods that need to be able to work with those diverse data, some of the core principles and concepts coming out of computer science begin to come into play. Similarly, and this is where the statisticians have gotten short shrift, I think, in this uh, enthusiasm over data science, because the, the st statistical discipline has, from its very beginnings, had a focus on making sense of data, making sense of increasingly large collections of data, and managing those data to answer those questions. So statistical and mathematical approaches continue to have a key role in this, this interdisciplinary approach of data science. And then finally we have um, 
what you know, many in this room uh, uh, have, ad have adapted in terms of um, library and information sciences playing a role in this overall enterprise where if we envision you know, this now rectangular Venn diagram of the intersection between these disciplines, you know, we can think of you know, sort of the smaller intersections where you know, I particularly like this one as you think about uh, you know, sort of the, the nascent computer scientists engaging also within their research teams and coming up with, in many cases, very elegant hacks for being able to do their analyses to work with those complex data sets. But you have these other areas as well where you already have existing connections between these various disciplines. Um, when you talk about sort of the traditional research model that, that we, um, we and the researchers with the university are most familiar with, that traditional research model does intersect to a greater or lesser extent a number of these, these disciplinary areas. Probably the, dis the distinguishing characteristic of data science is it tends to expand that center the, the, and, and uh, actually formalize the connections across these different disciplinary areas a little more systematically. It has a larger footprint at that intersection and it is more explicitly interdisciplinary um, in its approach to working with the answering the questions about large data collections, large complex questions uh, that are data intensive. So when it comes down to it, you know, we're really uh, needing to think about being able to distinguish between research and data science. And you know, the questions you know, are, are not clear at this point, but here are some ideas about some questions we need to be thinking about in terms of distinguishing between research and data science. One is the much broader range of disciplinary questions that we encounter within, say, a university than Google or Facebook or LinkedIn are dealing with in their particular niche areas where they're working on problems that relate to more focused issues. Where within the university, we have all of those academic disciplines that I was talking about earlier. So that's one area where data science within a university can be significantly different from data science as, as it is practiced sort of out in the, out in the world. Um, another interesting characteristic of data science within a university is it is largely researcher driven. The researchers themselves are defining the problems that they're, that they're going to uh, attack and they're defining the methods they're going to use to, uh, to do that. And as a result, there's a significant um, sort of cultural uh, approach that needs to be taken when thinking about the integration of data science methods into the university and into the research enterprise of the university. And we also find ourselves within the university uh, in the difficult position of not being able to necessarily de uh, define and demonstrate the value proposition to our researchers and to the supporters of that research in terms of the return on investment for the infrastructure, the changes in, uh, in uh, habitual work habits, um, adoption of new technologies. All of these things are both more difficult to measure in terms of the potential impact and as a result, provide a challenge in terms of moving forward with the adoption of data science uh, approaches within the university. And with that, we can now move to consideration of data science within the broader university research enterprise. And we can think of it um, actually very nicely in terms of these related concepts of uh, the Gartner hype cycle, if you've, uh, if you've seen that where the Gartner group uh, basically looks at different technology areas and uh, define sort of the level of maturity of those technologies using actually these uh, terms that you can barely see on the screen um, but are very evocative of the, the thinking process that a community may go through in terms of considering the adoption of, um, of new technologies. And data science can in some respects be considered a new technology. There are also knowledge and human support uh, aspects to it, but there's also a technical uh, model, so, so this would map to it. 
So if you can see on this, on, this, uh, on this chart here, we've got a technology trigger. This is essentially the creation or, or the invention of a new technology or technical approach, which for those of us who are uh, the early adopters in uh, Jeffrey Moore's uh, uh, representation of sort of tech, new technology adoption, uh, those of us who are enthusiastic about new technology and are typically those who embrace it and experiment with it and you know, I work on identifying the sharp edges associated with those technologies, intentionally or unintentionally, um, those early adopters are typically going to climb this hill to the peak of inflated expectations where we think that this is going to be the answer to all of our questions and solve the ills of the world. Invariably, we're disappointed. Uh, and we drop into what they, uh, what they love to describe as the trough of disillusionment. <laughs> Where, you know, our, our, our inflated expectations were not met, and all the news stories are coming out about how the bubble has burst and how these technologies are not going to work for us, and they're actually evil and are going to result in the surveillance of all of us and the loss of all of our freedom. Uh, <laughs> This, this transition from this peak of inflated expectations down to the trough of disillusionment really corresponds very well with what Jeff Moore uh, described as the chasm. This is the gap over which adopters of new technologies need to be transitioned. And this really is often a matter of moving them from one place to another. And so it's a matter of lifting them up, adopt, you know, producing more realistic descriptions and expectations about technologies, what the benefits are, what the costs are, so that those who are still early adopters um, are willing to make that, make that decision, adopt those technologies, and integrate them into their practice. Because it's only after you hit a critical mass of early adopters that you start to climb out of the trough of disillusionment into this slope of, en of enlightenment. <laughs> where you know, there's enough of a critical mass around the adoption of a particular technology and there are enough people out there using it, talking about it, and learning about it that you're able to eventually move into this plateau of productivity where use of those technologies and capabilities have been routinized to a large extent and assimilated into the processes that folks are using. So if we translate this into sort of a visual metaphor, we're needing to basically bring data science into the research enterprise so that we can move beyond the research teams that essentially could hack together their own sort of informal data management, data analytic tools into something that's certainly going to get them to the end product in terms of their envisioned research project but they're likely to start to encounter some limitations as they want to take on larger or more complex projects. They're collaborating with uh, larger groups of folks that may or may not be within their discipline. They're needing to share data more effectively within those groups. They're basically dealing with more complex research activities driven by data and communication that might require more highly engineered and designed capacity. So they might start to develop internal knowledge. They might have specialists within their research teams that know the statistical software that they're using particularly well or can do database design. They're starting to build some internal capacity to address those more complex issues and, and really mitigate the challenges that they're finding as their research evolves in, more into this data intensive approach. Finally, you get to the point where you're needing, uh, in some instances, some highly engineered solutions. Some solutions that cannot be developed by individual research teams. They require the support of many other players. They need the folks to be working outside of their research team to enable them to do the work that they're doing. And that's really where our institutional support can come in to do this. So what we're talking about is taking what is sort of the traditional research life cycle that our researchers on campus or any place else are most familiar with. This is something they live in day in and day out. 
And as, you know, this is the high level cycle and then you can think of the actual research process itself as having some additional steps. We're needing to uh, conceptually map the steps in this research cycle into um, a, a, a framework that those of us that are working in the realm of data management, curation, and analysis are more familiar with in terms of a data life cycle. And to do that, we need to effectively communicate to and really integrate into those research practices that, that are already existent within the, the various disciplines on our campus into the models that we have that relate to the data life cycle, the production of data, the uh, assessment of those data, the curation of those data for use both within a project and also for sharing beyond the end of a project. These are all concepts that can map into this data life cycle. I'm, and I'm not saying that we necessarily need to have all of our researchers become experts in the data life cycle, but we need to be able to have um, the ability to bridge the concepts from what they know into these broader concepts of how do we manage and analyze data to the benefit of the research enterprise. Ultimately, hoping that we're going to be able to produce structured knowledge that includes both the traditional outputs of the research enterprise, but also the data products that are coming out so that those are as accessible and as usable as the books that we've had on the shelves for centuries and the databases that we now have access to, where those databases remain largely ways to access those published materials. Moving forward, being able to have those databases, those discovery and access tools, able to drill into the uh, vast quantity of data that are coming out of those research activities as well. So finally, the data scientists and how they fit into this sort of view at the high level and within this concept of, of uh, data science. Um, this is uh, uh, 11 years worth of words that came out of the titles from uh, the Data Sciences Journal. And you can see that there's actually quite a variety of concepts that are embedded in these, in these terms coming out of this disciplinary journal for data science. Of course, you know, there are the key, key items that are the, the you know, data, database, um, information, science. Okay, you know, th those are pretty much a given. But if you look a little bit more closely, you start to drill down into uh, many, many other concepts. You know, you have, you have uh, spatial here as a particular class of data that data scientists are working with. Um, you have sharing as another key concept that shows up in a number of these papers. You have analysis. So this isn't just management of data, but it's enabling and facilitating analysis and performing the analysis on those data. Management of those data. Um, international. This is not just a, a, a local or parochial issue. This is an international activity, and it's one where there is um, growing uh, standardization across uh, national boundaries in terms of data exchange, documentation, formats, and those sorts of things. Um, so if we think about this, this is a picture of the diversity of ideas and areas of expertise that fit within the idea of the data scientist. And one way this has been described is in terms of this T-shaped data scientist, which I prefer to be pear-shaped data scientist, as I often envision myself. Uh, <laughs> But, uh, but in this case, this is the result of a survey of 250 self-selected respondents um, as they went through a survey and did two things as a part of this. Number one, they self-identified as developers or engineers, researchers, scientists, statisticians. And then in terms of ultimately drilling down to sort of different categories of data scientists. And then they also then uh, talked about the core skills that they, that they exercise or that they have. Those were also then sort of brought up into these five categories of skill sets. And the interesting thing is that, you know, as you have basically the, uh, the uh, practitioners up at the top and the skill sets on the side, in this visualization of the key skill 
um, across those different um, areas, you have a fair degree of diversity. You certainly have dominant skills that are the primary skills of these, these various practitioners, but it's not you know, clearly all of one particular type of skill. Um, you know, data researchers potentially have a fairly small proportion of, of uh, software of programming as, as a skill that they use, but it's still there as one of the key, key skills for some of those respondents in term, that classified themselves into one of these categories you have researcher, scientist, or statistician that were clustered together into that data researcher category. So we have one view of the diversity of skills that different types of data scientists are employing in terms of their key skill areas. Another way of viewing this, and this is where we get into this T-shaped scientist model, where many of these researchers, many of these data scientists, actually have skills across a number of, of areas. So as we are looking at those you know, programming and other aspects, um, you could think of this T-shaped scientist as potentially having deep skills in one area, but then having some skill across a number of other disciplinary areas. Um, and this translates relatively well, while the focus in this, this application was more in sort of business data scientists, we could think of domain expertise, that expertise in your particular humanities or engineering or science discipline as a proxy for sort of that business domain expertise. You can see that depending on the particular class of data scientists, the data researchers in particular show this fairly well, the data business person as well, where you have you know, an area of high skill. This is essentially where they characterize the, a high level of proficiency, but they have a moderate level of proficiency and knowledge across a number of these other skill areas. So while it's unrealistic to expect that any given individual who is practicing data science is, is going to be an expert in everything, this model is a nice way of being able to characterize the capabilities of individuals within an organization or operation so that you can identify complementarity. So that as you're bringing a group together to solve a particular problem, as you're identifying the human resources that you have, you can have an understanding of where your, where your strengths and weaknesses are, what gaps you need to fill in terms of the multiple skill sets that you're needing to use to solve a particular data science problem. So with that um, behind us, I have a few suggestions in terms of a direction forward in terms of how an institution like the university and like the university libraries within UNM can um, really start to work on bringing data science to the fore institutionally. Um, one of those being recognizing that this is a process. Um, it isn't just an end point, but it's something that we need to think about strategically, that we need to plan for, and that we need to be thinking about in terms of, you know, talking earlier about this, you know, peak of expe uh, inflated expectations and this trough of disillusionment thinking about models for working with the researchers on campus um, where we can perhaps lower this peak and raise this trough so that we don't necessarily lose folks as we're trying to cross that chasm. Because if we create unrealistic expectations, um, if we essentially overpromise and underdeliver, we're likely to lose uh, potential participants in this migration into more data intensive science uh, within the university. Um, so the first one is thinking strategically about our process and how we communicate capabilities that we want to be able to provide and the, the benefits of the use of those capabilities. Um, we need to build on our existing capabilities within the university. We have actually, um, the universities as institutions have a unique set of characteristics that provide a significant advantage over sort of the corporate data science activities that are going on where, you know, basically the, the companies have to recruit uh, candidates for doing their data science from, yes, a broad external community, but ultimately they're limited to those folks that they can hire. 
We have a natural resource within the university in terms of domain experts across all the major uh, research domains that, that exist. Those areas of expertise can be part of the resources, this interdisciplinary approach to data science, where we need a combination of technical knowledge, theoretical knowledge, domain knowledge. We have all of those here at the university. So being able to identify those key players, those folks that would be inclined to and, and, and interested in participating in these collaborative efforts across the university um, would significantly strengthen our ability to move forward in doing data science as an institution. Finally, you know, there are gaps that, that need to be filled within an institution like the university. And that typically involves investment of some sort. Um, those gaps first need to be, be identified. And we often will think about it in terms of uh, technical capacity. You know, we need more spinning disks. We need faster pipes for transferring data across campus. Um, those may be necessary, but they are not sufficient to really meet the needs that we're talking about in terms of moving data science forward um, on, at the university or anywhere else. I hope by this point you've also uh, been able to see that there's a significant human knowledge dimension. There's a human resource that we also need to think about cultivating, in some cases acquiring, within the institution so that we can fill any of those knowledge gaps or skill gaps that as we're trying to move forward in the work that we're doing, um, we can have the broadest impact from those in investments, which necessarily are limited just as we operate in a resource-constrained environment. But by going through, first the process of identifying where those gaps are, and then figuring out how we can fill those with the strategic investments of our limited resources, we can move forward with the expansion of, of essentially data science services campus-wide. And with that, um, here are some key resources that certainly informed uh, the presentation I did today. Um, and then, uh, of course, some acknowledgments in terms of some other ideas and concepts that contributed to this. Um, and with that, I'll be ready for any questions.